Okay, in terms of the stuff, as usual, just bad news. Deadlines remain as they've uh, been all along. So exam three, exam four, quizzes part four. Deadline of by April 24th at the end of the day is 11 to 9, 59 p.m. Exam number five, the final deadline is on Thursday, April 30th at noon. For the paper, plus five deadline is today, April 14th. At end of day, 11 to 9, 59 p.m. Attorney just go to Blackboard, go to the paper thing, and or you go to the announcement, go to the link, select the file, double check the file, triple check the file, upload the file, and then I'll start um, grading them today. And the plan is to have them graded uh, tomorrow, barring any disasters. For a credit deadline, if you want to, you know, you figure out you can get more points by getting more time. Deadline is 421, it's a week from today, also at the day, 11 to 9, 9 p.m. And uh, half credit for desperation would be on the 24th, also end of day. In terms of the grade breakdown, basically as follows. For the exams, best four out of five, and they're 40%, which means that if you're satisfied with the, you know, your grades on the, the four sectional exams, you can avoid the final. Taking the final can't lower your grade though, because if you get a zero one, or get, you know, do worse on the other ones, it gets dropped off, and it's already at this moment assumed, unless you've done it, assumed to be zero. And Blackboard is set to, as I mentioned before, to treat anything you haven't done as a zero, and it's already started, you know, dropping stuff. So you'll fire up your web browser, go to Blackboard with your overall grade. That gives you your real grade in real time for what you get if you just stop doing this stuff. So it's already treating anything you haven't done as a zero, and it's already keeping or dropping stuff, whether you look at it as keeping or dropping. With the quizzes, their best 10 out of the whole set, regardless of section, they were 30%. And then for the paper, it's the best paper out of the paper, and that's 30%. So that's the grade down and breakdown. Before going to more David Hume, talking about personal identity, a bit about ethics, and some stuff about religion, anything about any previous Hume stuff, or stuff that has been, or stuff to be, that needs more stuff. Okay. So now we turn to look at what David Hume has to say about personal identity. And as we saw when you're looking at our good dead friend John Locke, he's addressing kind of the same, you know, same basic philosophical issue. Personal identity, key part of it is what is it to be a person. Hume doesn't go into the terrible much detail what it is to be a person in the, the way Locke did. There's also the question of what it is to be the same person you know, across time. What is it that makes the you of now, the same as the you of then, and the you of the future, what it, it ties it all together. Now Hume, again, is an empiricist. So he's going to look at personal identity from an empirical standpoint. So he's going to go into his, you know, his mind's eye and look around to find the person. So he begins by looking at other philosophers. And he says the other philosophers claim that we're always conscious of what they call the self. And they claim we can feel its existence and continuity, and we can be certain of its perfect identity and simplicity. So even though it doesn't name names, he's probably thinking about you know, our good dead friend John Locke, who believed that you know, the self is essentially, roughly put, your consciousness and your memory, or even more informally put, you, know, you are your memory, and that's something that you know, Locke thought we were you know, kind of always aware of. If you are your memory, if you remember it was you, you don't remember it, not you. He might also perhaps be thinking of Descartes. Descartes, as we saw, believed like in the, the self as the metaphysical substance, it's immaterial, and that would be you know, Descartes' view of him. Now Hume's approach is this. He says, you know, I've read these other dead guys, well, they were dead then, but read these other guys, they say this stuff, so he's going to go in and look himself. And what he finds is this. When he goes and looks with his mind's eye on a mental safari, all he finds is perceptions, a particular perception or the other. A perception of, well, we can use the example of this world, a feeling of humidity and warmth. Uh, perceptions of, you know, light and color and shapes and so forth feeling like maybe an itchy feeling in your foot, a little hunger, you know, you feel in your, your stomach, and so forth. 
that all you find is perceptions. You're never without a perception when you're perceiving, and that's all that you can see. So when you go into the mind, all that you see is perceptions. Now, he thinks, or claims, that if his perceptions are removed for any length of time, such as during a dream of sleep, that he would be gone. No perception, no self. And if they were removed permanently, such as by death, that he would be permanently gone. We're not going to look at Hume's uh, writings on you know, skepticism regarding mortality, but he was skeptical about that. He believed that, you know, he, didn't, he didn't think he could conclusively prove there is no immortality, but he was pretty confident that it couldn't be proved that it does exist. Now, in a nice bit of, I guess, generosity, he does note that maybe his experience is unusual. He goes in, you know, looks around with his mind's eye. He doesn't see that Lockean self, or perhaps the Cartesian self. He just runs in there and runs into perceptions. But, he says, perhaps other people, that's what they see. And Hume notes, wisely, that he can have no dispute with them because maybe they just are fundamentally different from him. And he invites, as he often does, the reader to try it at all, to do it themselves and see what they can find. So, what does he think that the person is? Well, this can be illustrated by bad drawings. He regards the person as this. We can take a particular moment in time, like right now. And we can think of, and again, this will be, you know, inaccurate because I'm, you know, badly drawing stuff. But think of each. Each perception is like a, think of it as like a bubble, you know, not connected to the others. So this would be, say, an itchy feeling in your foot. This would be like a perception, you know, humidity, perception of warmth, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for all the perceptions. Now that would be all the percep your perceptions of that, that moment. So roughly put, for Hume, you are at any given moment of time the perceptions that you are experiencing. So you are a bundle of perceptions. Now, Locke seemed to believe that kind of surrounding all that perceptions is, you know, a soul that's, you know, there's a consciousness, possibly a soul holding that, and then a body typically around that. For him, though, he just had this bundle. Now, what he also thinks is that at the next moment, that the perceptions are all now different. So they can be similar, but the idea is that each moment in, in time, you have a new bundle of perceptions making up you. So it'd be like your feelings, perceptions, and so forth at that exact moment. And then <clears throat> the next instant, it'd be different. Maybe some resemblance, but it'd be different. And so he thinks that there's no identity across time. So the contents of your perceptions in this moment are not identical to those in this moment. We are bundles. And sort of the crappy analogy I always use is if you do the dishes, you get a sink full of bubbles. The bubbles are popping and forming, popping and forming. It's kind of like that, except there's, you know, with the, with the bubbles, they're all kind of connected by the water and the soap. But just imagine you have bubbles forming and popping, forming and popping. And that's kind of what's going on. So your mind is like a bubble, like a bunch of bubbles, kind of. Now, he does draw an analogy to the mind being like a theater, a kind of a theater where the various perceptions make their appearance and then you know, vanish or go their way. But he's careful to point out that we shouldn't be misled by the analogy. <coughs> Because by the analogy, we go, you know, we take it, you know, in a way kind of too literally, we end up with a stage, you know, curtain and actors on the stage. But Hume wants to be be careful about that and say, we have no idea of, you know, where, where this is taking place, what kind of stuff it is, and in in a way, his 
is their analogy, he sort of automatic sort of admits, is that it's a pretty crappy analogy. He says, well, really can't say what a stage is made out of, and no, you know, really there's kind of no stage, it's just the perceptions, etc. Now, one way to kind of illustrate the way Hume is looking at this, we can use the crappy analogy of, you know, this projection. We could say the mind is kind of like, you know, the projection here, but we really have no idea about what is being projected on or what's projecting it, but it's like this kind of deal. Okay, so so far for Hume, we get the mind being a bunch of perceptions, and his justification for that is, you know, empirical. He says he goes in and looks, and what does he see? Nothing but perceptions. And being an empiricist, if it's not coming into the senses, you have no justification for believing in it, and so the self for him is going to be that. So in his view, you are a bundle of perceptions. Now, before pressing on to our next exciting slide, anything about the bundles that needs more bundling stuff? Okay. So now, without further ado, next slide. Now, here we get is addressing the question on why is it that we believe? Why do we ascribe identity to the successive bundles of perceptions? Exactly. <laughs> he's wondering about that himself. He's an, he's an inquiring mind. And so we wonder, like, you know, why do we think that, you know, why do I think in my, my own case that I'm the same me that was here, you know, last week? Why do we think we have this identity of self? That I'm me across time. Well, so many claims. Every distinct perception, he says, is a distinct existence. So, Again, going back to my crappy drawing, you know, crappy example, this would be like you at T1, like right now. This would be you like the next, you know, moment of time. And he claims there's no identity between them. So there's, you know, crudely put, this is all your perceptions now. A you know, moment of time later, all the perceptions. And they're not identical. Nothing, nothing between them is identically the same. To use again, kind of a crappy analogy, it's like you get a sink, you know, full of bubbles. Then all the bubbles, you know, then all the bubbles like vanish, and then you have new bubbles that look kind of like the old bubbles. But of course, given a human view, you really can't say it's even in a sink. Uh, so you know, obviously, things get kind of kind of messy. So then the question is, why then do we think that from moment to moment that I am me and you are you? Well, again, he claims when we go in, you know, perceive, we don't perceive a connection. To use, you know, a crappy analogy, we don't see like a thread, you know, running through, connecting these bundles together. Or to use maybe a better or less crappy analogy, if we think of like each moment in time, it's like a, uh, like a gemstone, or you know, like a bead. We don't see the neck, you know, the, the thread that holds a necklace together. So using my crap analogy, if each moment is like a bead and our entire existence is like a necklace, we never see the, the thread. We just see, you know, bead one, bead two, bead three, bead four. So then why do we think all the beads are connected to make, you know, in my case, me, in your case, you? Now again, Hume is doing kind of a psychological analysis of this. So how does this work? What's what he claims? As we saw before in the ancient days of previous classes, Hume claims are basically the following relations. We've got resemblance. So something looks, you know, using the visual thing, looks like something else. Now in the case of our perceptions from moment to moment, they do resemble. And I can use a crappy analogy to illustrate this. I mean, take, for example, the, the camera that's filming this. If we were to you know, load the digital file into an image edit or a video editing thing, we'd see you know, the you know, film strips, so to speak. And even though they'd be different, because each scene is different because you know, they're moving around and stuff, we would see a resemblance. They look alike. And so resemblance, you know, at least according to Hume, seems to be in play. 
you could take, you know, for example, the perceptions you're having right now, and an instant later, they're kind of similar. Not identical. You know, your, your head's moved a bit, you feel a little different, but there's a similarity between them. And according to Hume, one thing that sort of leads us to believe of a connection is that similarity. Now, what about the other relations? Well, there's also contiguity, which for him is you know, proximity in space and time. And Hume claims that you know, this contiguity doesn't come into play here. The third relation for him is causation. I remember from the ancient days a couple classes ago, for Hume, causation is essentially, you know, very crudely put, kind of habituation. A occurs, B occurs, that happens a whole bunch. We become habituated to expect B on the occurrence of A. So how does cause and effect work into there? Well, this is what he claims. Memory comes into play there. And here's how here's how the memory thing works for a good dead friend you. You know, badly drawn, badly drawn circle things. So here's like your perceptions at the moment, like right now. It's called T1. Then at the next instant, you have similar perceptions. Now what you do, according to Hume, is you remember those previous perceptions. Presumably they're, they're gone. Hume doesn't really say like where they come from or where they go to. It's all kind of a big mystery. But you have this new set. And you remember what the previous set used to look like. And what you note, know, according to Hume, is through your memory, you note know a resemblance between them that what, what you're perceiving you know, an instant ago resembles what you're perceiving now. So you connect them by, you know, through the use of memory and resemblance. And for him, resemblance is the way that we call up these past perceptions. And so what we do essentially as Hume sees this is we recollect our past perceptions, however that that works. So we remember back, you know, say like back to the beginning of the class, you know, back 18 minutes ago. And so what we do is you kind of think in a memory, okay, this resembles that, resembles that, resembles that, and then we use the resemblance, you know, to tie them all together. And so as Hume sees it, that's part of how we, we come about having this notion of personal identity. I have my perceptions now, I call up a memory of my past perceptions, like what the room looked like last week, I see the resemblance and so, you know, I, I connect me now with me then, through memory and resemblance, or so we call it. So what about the cause and effect then? Well, here he draws an analogy between the self and a commonwealth, a country. Let's take, uh, well, take his example. Well, we'll use a different example. We we'll use the United States, but we we'll use his, his method. Now, take the United States in 2015, and we can go back to the beginning, uh, 1776, if you want to go Declaration of Independence, or 1789, if you want to go, you know, constitution-wise. But, you know, quite a while back. Now, does the United States today have the same people it had back then? Yeah, because they're all pretty, pretty dead. Do we have the exact same land? Now yeah, we had 13 colonies then. Now we have a lot more, more stuff. Stuff that used to belong to the people. Now it's our land. It is not. It, it's not their land because we took it from them. So they don't have it. Yeah, the classic, classic song. That's a song, right? Anyway, so yeah, we have more land. What about laws? Do we have like more laws now than back then? Yeah, a whole bunch. So, you know, all kinds of stuff is different. You know, Hume was a historian, so, you know, a reasonable question would be, how is this still the United States? You know, because the people are different, the land's quite a bit different, the laws are different. Well, Hume says, you know, cause and effect. 
if you, you know, go back to either 1776 or 1789, you have a causal succession between, you know, each of the kind of like time slices of the United States. And so you can trace back from 2015 back to the laws, the people, the land, back to 1789 or 1776, whichever you prefer. And so the sort of his you know, second approach there is we've got, you know, resemblance, we have memory, we remember our past perceptions, we see the resemblance, we kind of tie stuff together, you know, this is like this, so yeah, that's me. And then we use the you know, cause and effect. Just as we say, like, the United States goes back to 1776 or 1789, we'd also say that, you know, by analogy, in my own case, even though, like, I'm not identical now to then, there's a causal, you know, chain. If you trace back from now to however back you go. In my case, you know, 1776. Not that Okay, 1400. <laughs> and so, you know, we trace ourselves back and say, well, you know, we've got a causal chain going back. That's me. Now, but again, for Hume, we don't actually see, to use my crappy analogy, if each instant in time is like a bead, we never do see the thread that holds it together. We see the resemblance, and we say, oh, there, you know, there's a connection. We are habituated, we claim, you know, cause and effect. But in Hume's analysis of causation, we never actually see cause and effect. Now, before going to the home stretch on personal identity, anything about the stuff so far that needs more stuff? Bad drawings, bad examples, crappy analogies, meaningless gestures, anything? Okay. Now, one thing that Hume does that's similar to our good dead friend Locke, Locke, when discussing the matter of skepticism, said that what really matters to us is not do we know that stuff is out there really real for real. What matters is a practical thing, that it's good enough to know that not that is fire really real for real. It's enough to know that you, if you stand in what is, seems to be fire, it seems to hurt a whole bunch. So you shouldn't do that. Now, Hume takes a similar sort of practical approach to personal identity. What matters to us, he seems to indicate, is not so much, you know, our big worry about the metaphysics of it, but a matter of concern. You know, kind of crudely put, that we are concerned about, you know, the future. We are concerned about, you know, what will happen next. And we're concerned about the past. So kind of the practical thing of personal identity for him is that concern. That what we're what we focus on is we think about, you know, well, and to use a couple of crappy illustrations, if there's something in someone's past that may cause them trouble. Take the example of Hillary Clinton. You know, she announced she's running for president. And of course there are things, you know, like the issue with the e her own private email server, the issues with Benghazi, Whitewater, Mark Lewinsky, etc. Maybe. She's pretty clever, though. They're going to bury her with Benghazi. She's not making it out of the primary. They're going to oh. bury her. Ne never, like they say, never count Hillary out of anything. Okay. I'm not a betting person, but I would probably bet on, on her because she's she knows how to work. She knows how to play the game. Yeah, she does. She does. I know that. So, we take, you know, we take Hillary, trace back to, say, Benghazi. And, of course, we could say, you know, Hume's right. You know, in a way, what kind of connects her back to that is her concern about that. She's concerned about that, that past. And so, in a way, she kind of thinks it's her because it's something she's worried about. And, of course, you know, all the people on Fox News think it's her because, they're, like I said, they're going to bring that, bring that up. Yeah, and so our psychological concerns, you know, connect to our, he says, our imagination. You know, we imagine, you know, a connection between, you know, the moments in time, and we're worried about, you know, in the case of Hillary Clinton, worried about our past coming, you know, she's worried about her past coming back to haunt her, and we're also concerned about the future. We, for example, we work in, in 
the hope of the future paycheck, or we you know go to class in the hope of the future grant and to graduate. And so our concern, you know, gives us sort of that, you know, connection to personal identity. Now the memory thing. What he claims is this. Now with our good dead friend John Locke, Locke seemed to claim that the person you know, kind of crudely put, a person is his or her consciousness, and as far back as you remember, that's you. So Locke seems to take the person to be his or her memory. So what you remember, if you remember doing it, it was you. Now Hume, he, he thinks this. He doesn't think that memory is personal identity. So if you're asked, you know, if he was alive, you'd say, Dave, is a person his or her memory? And he, so if he's alive, he'd say, well, no. So how does memory, you know, work here? What does it do? Well, for him, the answer is this. For Locke, remember, you know, crudely put, a person is his or her, her memory. And the, uh, for Hume, though, it's a different kind of deal. A person isn't his memory or her memory. Memory doesn't give us personal identity. Memory discovers it. Because, again, kind of his analysis is you remember your past perceptions. You say, gosh, my past perceptions resemble my current perceptions. Ah, I see the resemblance. So I imagine a connection. I imagine you're linked. So once you have memory, at least according to Hume, you get the notion of cause and effect. Once you have the notion of cause and effect, then you get the notion of identity. So again, kind of his view is, I remember back to what was happening a little while ago. I note the resemblance. I then claim there's a cause and effect relation. And then I say, yep, uh, I've discovered personal identity. So memory enables us, according to Hume, to discover personal identity, but it isn't personal identity. I'll use a crappy analogy. Suppose I recognize someone by the hat they wear. Now the hat isn't the person, it's just how I recognize the person. And so likewise with this, your memory isn't the personal identity, it's basically how you, the mechanism by which you are able to have that, that notion, according to him. So once you get memory, you get cause and effect, you get the, you know, once you, once you get memory and resemblance, you get the notion of cause and effect, once you get that, you get the concept that there's a connection, and then you get personal identity, or so we close. So why does he think that Locke is wrong? Well, again, part of it is what he uses memory for. He does agree if you ask, you know, Hume, is memory like important for personal identity? He'd say, sure. You can't, if you didn't remember anything, you'd have no notion of personal identity is you'd never be able to have any concept of existing across time because you'd have no concept of time. But he claims memory is not personal identity. So he is not his memory, you're not your memory. What's the problem? Well, this is the claim. If memory is, is personal identity, then if you forget, it wouldn't be you. What he's kind of doing here is basically an argument by intuition. Intuitively, do we think that if we forget something, that is not us? For example, like suppose you're taking a test, and you can't remember the answer to the question. You say, well, I guess it wasn't me that was there, because I can't remember. I mean, one thing would be good, because imagine, imagine if that was the case, if you forgot something, it wasn't you. So if you're like, I didn't think you must have known that so yeah, sometimes you know, you like something. I know this question. But yeah, you may think, you know, because I intuitively think, yeah, I can't remember it now, but I, I know I was there. I don't remember that particular thing, but I remember like, the, I remember everything except for the one thing I need. <laughs> yeah, so we intuitively think that we forget stuff, but we think that we're, you know, still the same, uh, same person, even though we forget. Although it could be kind of handy because. Because imagine if you could use that for real. So if you're getting like you're married for your anniversary, you'd say, well, it wasn't me that forgot, 
by definition, because I forget it's not me. It'd be the perfect excuse. Now, would people buy that, though? Would that work? If you forgot your if you're married, if you're your anniversary, you could, but would that? You know, no, not even with a philosopher, probably not. Not something I've tried. <laughs> yeah, so Hume seems to be right, that we, we intuitively think that we forget stuff, but we think it's still us. We don't say, I forgot, so it wasn't me. We say, I forgot. And he thinks that the people who make personal identity, you know, personal identity grounded on memory, have to explain that. And he thinks he's basically got a better, you know, better story. Now at this point, he seems to have laid out a theory of, you know, personal identity stuff. Self is bound to perceptions, you've got, you know, your memory calls up past perceptions, you know, the resemblance, then you, you know, get this notion of cause and effect, then you come up with the notion of identity, you know, this causal connection linking you to your past, you know, perceptions. Then Hume gets kind of, well, I was going to say kind of weird, but he gets weirder. This is how the end plays out. Even though he's gone through carefully laying out his view of personal identity, he says, to quote him, he says, all questions concerning personal identity can never possibly be decided and are to be regarded as grammatical rather than philosophical difficulties. Why well, I think that, well, this is what he claims. Identity, he claims, depends on the relations of ideas that produce identity through the easy transition they occasion. But the problem is this. The relations and easiness of transition may insensibly diminish. And we have no just standard, no way to tell when identity has faded or whether it remains. And so he claims all disputes about identity are purely verbal. So what does he mean by that? Well, There are various you know, possible interpretations, like with anything in philosophy. But one way to sort of look at it would be, well, that by grammatical, we can mean is simply, what is the correct usage of words like I and me? It's a matter of grammar. So why is there a problem? Well, what Hume seems to see is, is this is the problem. We don't have any way to clearly define that connection between, you know, the past perceptions. Or put it another way, we don't have a clear demarcation about when it's still, in my case, me, and when it ceases to be me. They may think, well, how could that be? Aren't I always me? Well, let's jump ahead to like the 21st century and considerations about, you know, how medical stuff sort of practically impacts questions about like identity. So let's take the non-implausible view that a person is, you know, we'll take a think about that the person is, as Hume claims, you know, perceptions, and we connect back to our past, you know, our past. Now think about um, something like Alzheimer's. What happens in Alzheimer's? Yeah, the memory starts to go, the connection starts to break down, and there is an interesting and important question about whether when a person's like in the stage where they don't remember stuff, their personality has changed, are they still the same person? You know, when you when you kind of clearly remember, like at your age, you clearly remember the past, you know, you can recall stuff, you forget things, you know, here and there, but you have a pretty good recollection of the past and a clear connection. So you'd say, well, yeah, that's clearly me. But then you jump ahead, you know, 60, 70 years, and imagine yourself like way, you know, way down the line, forgetting all this stuff, etc. It may be reasonable to think, well, maybe the person's now, now gone, that the connection's not, not there. So Hume does kind of raise an interesting problem. Namely, on one hand, again, he goes through all this stuff and says, you know, bundle perceptions, you know, resemblance, etc. And then he kind of runs into that practical problem. How do we, you know, sort of tie back to the past? And when that starts to, you know, kind of fray and fade, and there is no longer that clear connection, 
can we really say that's the same person? And Hume basically, in a way, kind of gives up. He kind of throws up his hands and says, eh, it's not a philosophical dispute. You know, ignore all the stuff I've just said. It's all a matter of grammar. We just need to work out, you know, the correct use of the word ah. What kind of interesting problem there? More of like a giving up than a solution. So that takes us through Hume's view of personal identity. Kind of the key things are, again, he started, kind of starts off, the self is a bundle of perceptions. We use memory to recall our past perceptions. Then we see the resemblance. We get the notion of cause and effect. And then we, like with the analogy of a commonwealth, you know, connect in our imagination the things together. Also our concerns tie us back to that past. Again, using the example of Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton of 20, you know, 15 of now, she has concerns about, you know, the Benghazi thing, the Whitewater, Monica Lewinsky, et cetera. And so those are, you know, it's concerns connecting her to her past. And she obviously can't get on YouTube and just say, well, you know, I accept a view of personal identity, so that's not, you know, I forget stuff, it's, I forgot it's not, not me anymore. Yeah, we wouldn't really buy that. So I do think intuitively that memory discovers personal identity, but that it isn't personal identity. It just because you forget stuff doesn't mean it's not you. So even if Hillary could honestly claim that she doesn't remember, you know, what happened, we wouldn't say, oh, well, it wasn't, I guess if you don't remember, it's not you. We'd say, well, you claim to forget, but it's still, still you. But then he ends up in, you know, sort of his end, end point, which is kind of that, you know, that problem, namely that he says, ah, oh, it's all a matter of brain. I can't clearly define the standard, so I can't sort this out. Now, that could be seen as him falling into a type of uh, false dilemma, you know, line drawing fallacy. I can't exactly say when it diminishes, when it ends, so there is none. But it may be a fair point, because if we have no way to demarcate the connection, we might say, well, then we really can't say there is a continuing self. So he kind of throws up his hands and says, time for a beer. Which is kind of his answer to a lot of stuff. So before moving away from personal identity to the last of Hume, anything about personal identity, it needs more PI stuff. Now, Hume also did some stuff in ethical theory. And his work on ethics is entitled An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals, with, of course, a fancy subtitle, namely, an attempt to introduce the experimental method of reasoning into moral subjects. And Hume really liked it. He thought it was one of his best books, or his best work. Now, we see here kind of a common theme. He notes that. If you look at you know, the sciences, physics or mathematics and geometry, that moral philosophy doesn't seem to have made a lot of progress. And this is a standard problem we saw with you know, looking at Descartes and Locke and others. Kind of the view, well, people have been working on all this stuff all, all this time, but they have yet to you know, make a lot of progress. Now, like the other dead guys we looked at, he believed we could take this scientific approach and apply it not just to you know, the sciencey stuff, but all the things. So what he wants to do is work out essentially a science of ethics. Now, typically when people do moral philosophy, one, like in the ethics class that I teach, one of the things they say is you know, moral theories are typically prescriptive. They're not just descriptive. Descriptive you know, describes, here's how things are. Prescriptive theory is supposed to say not just, here's how things are, here's good and evil and all that stuff, but also what we should do. Now Hume seems to be doing more of descriptive ethics. He's trying to describe how you know, moral principles arise, or what is their foundation, as opposed to, here's what you should do. Some more description than prescription. <coughs> like with his other stuff, his approach is superior. What he wants to do is basically observe human psychology and thus derive his theory of ethics. Now he also, interestingly and broadly enough, assumes morality is natural to human beings. And 
from this, he infers that people should have similar ethics. Now, interestingly or boringly enough, the approach Hume took back then is kind of one of the fads today. Ethics, like just like with you know, fashion, all philosophy, just like with fashion, goes through fads. You know, back in the 70s, bell-bottom pants were in. They came back as flare jeans. They went out, they'll be back again. Likewise, you know, in philosophy, the idea that you know, morality is naturally based, you know, came in with Hume, went out for a while, now it's all the rage with evolutionary theory and, and ethics. And it'll fade away, and it'll come back, and it'll fade away until there aren't any people left. Kind of like, just like the bell-bottom pants. 10,000 years from now, people are probably wearing bell-bottoms. They'll call them something else, though, like space jeans or something. Could be, could be space jeans. Who knows? Or maybe they'll name it after Hillary Clinton. Maybe they'll be called Hillary's or something. Could be. Clintons. Yeah, exactly. It could be a thing. If people have people have no idea why, they'll just call them Clinton bands. Clintons. You know, yeah, it could be a thing. It could be a thing. People will see it on the YouTubes and the Googles. Now, because of his assumption that people you know, had the same kind of you know, psychology, the way he often argues is what I would call an appeal to intuition. He asks people, hey, you know, you don't believe me, Kind of check yourself, see how you feel about this, or you know, look inside your own mind, see what's going on. Now, what Hume is probably you know, really known well for in ethics is this. We um, you know, saw back in the early days when looking at Hume that he draws a distinction between you know, matters of fact and relations of ideas, and he claims. Reason by itself can't give us knowledge about the world. You know, we can't just by a priori means know what's out there. Because, you know, he's an empiricist. Whatever you know about what's out there, real for real, has to come through the senses. You just can't sit in your easy chair proving, you know, the existence of stuff. Contrary to, you know, Descartes. So, since reason can't prove the stuff exists out there, he also claims it can't give us knowledge about morality. So we can't just sit down and you know, think our way through ethics. Now, given his, his options about you know, what kind of stuff we know, we have two basic idea, possibilities. For Hume, there are relations of ideas and matters of fact. So there's only two places ethics could go, given his, his theory either here or there. So let's get into the first one. Maybe ethics are matters of ideas, relations of ideas. Now he considers that, and he says, well, if that were true, then ethical truths would be just like the truths of logic and geometry. Because, for example, one relation of an idea would be, well, you know, like with a triangle. It's a three-sided figure. You know, So you've got you know by necessity if you have a triangle or a three-sided figure. Or if you're doing like a proof in geometry, you know you've got the result in certainty. Now, the plus side, of course, is certainty. You know if you have a triangle, you get a three-sided figure. The downside, at least according to Hume, is given his view, relations of ideas, although their truths are always true, they don't tell us anything about the world. And again, I always use my crappy example of a triangle. If I draw a triangle and put my hand over it, and I say, how many sides does it have? It, of course, will be three. You don't have to look. That's a relation of ideas. But to know what size it is, or to know that I drew a triangle, you'd have to actually look, which would be a matter of fact. Now, he thinks that if morality was like that, a relation of ideas, we could just by pure reason know right and wrong, good and bad. And there are some thinkers who did think that. Now Hume says, even though that would be like perhaps kind of cool, tragically not the case. Why not? Well, here's how he reasons. Morality claims its kind of function is to guide our actions. And he claims what reason gives us is truth or falsehood. We use reason to sort things through to find out what is true and not true. 
And he claims that morality is not about what is true or not true, but about what we ought to do. Now, Hume makes a critical assumption. He claims that reason, weirdly enough, is wholly in inactive, that so it cannot provide the foundation for something as active as conscience or, mor or morals. I mean, to use a kind of a crappy you know, comparison, Barclay, as you recall, believed that ideas were inert. You know, by idea, he doesn't mean like the idea of like democracy or justice. He means literally, you know, think of like, you know, literally like a pitcher. And he thinks that those are, they have no, no causal ethics, that, you know, can't do things. And Hume seems to see reason the same way, that somehow reason just can't, it doesn't have any like motive force behind it, or so he claims. So, given those critical assumptions, reason cannot be the foundation of ethics, because reason has, to, well, the foundation of ethics has to motivate, and reason does not, according to him. <coughs> so to his satisfaction, that eliminates the relation of ideas. So it leaves us with one option, at least according to Hume, namely matters of, of fact. And these are, you know, truths about the, the world, things that we have to, according to Hume, observe empirically. And again, going back to my crappy example, that a triangle has three sides is a relation of ideas. That there's a triangle that I draw a triangle would be a matter of fact. You have to look. Now, interestingly, morally enough, he thinks that morality is not about matters of fact either. How so? Well, here's his argument. Consider, he says, an action you think to be morally wrong or morally right, your choice. And he says, consider it on all sides, examining on all lights, and see if you can see in there, in the thing itself, the wrongness or the rightness. I mean, to put it in kind of a, kind of a stupid way, you can see him as sort of asking, like, okay, are we actually like detecting evil or detecting good? You know, could you, again, to use kind of a crappy illustration, could you like take a film of some, you know, what we consider to be an awful thing and look in the, you know, the film strip and say, yes, yes, there, there is the evil, right there. And I always use my crappy analogy, like looking for a ghost. You can say, there, there's the ghost in the film strip. Well, if we look at something, we don't see the evil. Now, centuries ago when I was in grad school, one of my fellow students had a pretty good illustration of this. Suppose you see, um, you know, you're like walking along, you know, let's say you're out on the, on the set, you're, walk, you're walking along and you hear someone like scream out something and you see someone like take a dagger and plunge it into the person's chest and they fall over and they, ah, you have slain me, you have slain me, et tu, Brutus, et tu. He falls to the ground, you go, oh my God, I've seen a terrible murder, you run off, you know, to say that you've seen a terrible death. Now, but then when you come back, and they say, oh no, you know, you come back with the police, and they're like, oh no, they're just, you know, they're doing Shakespeare, you know, on the set. They're doing Julius Caesar. You'd say, well, I guess I didn't see anything evil after all. Because you don't see the evil, you just see something happen. You don't see the evil. Again, not my example, what I stole from one of my associates from years ago. And so that's kind of human view. You don't actually see the evil in the action. You just see the stuff happening. So it's not a relation of ideas, and it's not a matter of fact. I mean, what is it? Where is the evil or the good? Well, here's his answer. He claims, and this view becomes very influential in later thinkers about ethics, that morality arises from the passions, from the feelings. So where is the evil? Well. Kind of put, kind of one way, the evil is in us. Not in the sense that we're bad, but in the, sense, in the following sense. If you're looking at the action, you don't see, at least according to him, you don't see any evil there or any good. The evil or good is how we feel about it. It's our emotional response. So kind of crudely, crudely put, is that 
we have a sentiment of disappropriation. We disapprove. We feel bad about it. Or if it's something good, we you know, approve of, we have a feeling of approval. So for Hume, the good and the bad and the ugly, not out there in the world. It's how we feel about things. So if you see someone seemingly stabbing someone in the chest with a dagger, the evil's not out there, it's how you feel about it. You feel bad about that. You, you regard it as evil. We didn't uh, look at Hume's view of art, but he has a similar view about beauty. Beauty's not out there. Beauty, as the saying goes, in the eye of the beholder. You don't see the beauty, you see something and you respond to it. It looks beautiful, crudely put, it looks beautiful to you. That's how it looks at ethics. That essentially, it's how you feel about it. If you feel bad about killing, killing's wrong. If you, if you feel good about helping out you know, puppies and kittens, then that's good. Now, he claims that passions, our feelings, are neither correct nor incorrect. Why? Because they're not about stuff. You know, for him, there's no such thing as like true feeling. You know, if you feel angry, you feel angry. You just do. You know, things like uh, matters of judgment. A judgment could be correct or incorrect. If you say, you know, that weighs five pounds, you can be right or wrong. If you say, that weighing five pounds makes me angry, well, you, you know, the anger is neither true or false. You just feel it, according to him. So he thinks that passions are neither incorrect nor incorrect. You just feel the way you do. And they can neither conform to reason nor be contrary to it, or so he claims. Now he does say some pretty radical stuff. For example, he says, and many philosophers and others have disagreed with him, that it is not contrary to reason to refer the destruction of the entire world to the scratching of your finger. So he would say from the standpoint of logic, if you're offered the following choice, if someone, if a villain said, I shall either scratch your finger a bit, nothing too serious, just a scratch, or I shall destroy the entire world. Hume claims that reason doesn't tell us which one is worse. It is not, neither is more rational than the other. Now again, other people have taken issue with that, but that's what Hume claims. Now, lest you think Hume is like some sort of horrifying monster who, who would rather see the world burn than scratch his finger, what he says what we have to do is not look at our reason, but look how we feel. And so reason doesn't tell us that a scratch is nothing compared to the destruction of the world. It's how we feel about it. We feel really bad, hopefully, or so he claims. So what he claims when he says that something is evil, roughly put, we're just saying we disapprove. We feel bad about it. To say something is good is to say that we approve. We feel good about it. And this became hugely influential with later thinkers, you know, the motivists, etc. The view that morality is a matter of the feelings and passions, and good is how we feel about something, feel good about it, or bad. Now, the last dead guy we'll look at, Immanuel Kant, takes kind of the opposite of you. Kant thinks that morality is about reason. Now, one of Hume's kind of signature quotes is this. He said famously that reason is and ought only to be a slave of the passions. They can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. And so his view is basically that the goal of reason is simply to do what our passions tell us to do, basically to figure out how to get what we want. Now again, Hume thinks that morality is about feeling rather than judgment, and he thinks that most people, I mean, in a way it sounds kind of like harsher than he thinks it is, because even though it sounds you know, pretty harsh, the finger thing, the world thing, Hume thinks that people basically feel the same way. That even though it's based on morality, morality is based on sentiment, he thinks we all kind of feel the same way, with some notable exceptions. Now, also kind of famous here, one of the things that uh, Hume didn't actually argue, just kind of said and then caught on, he claimed that you can never get a ought 
from it is. That's to say, you can't get what you should do from what is the case. So you can't get value from facts. And didn't actually argue that, he just kind of said it, but it kind of caught on, and people still love to quote it to this day. They can't get any art from it is. And of course, philosophers try to you know, disagree with that, saying we can't do that, but they say, no, you can't. So it made some important contributions. Before pressing on to more Hume, anything about it is and odds that needs more odds or isms. So to our next exciting slide. Now one thing of course he has to address is this. Obviously enough, when we have you know, society and civilization, we have moral rules. We have not just you know, laws, we have moral principles and guides and so forth. So it's kind of going to explain those. Now, he thinks they come from two main sources. Source one, social utility. Source two, sympathy. How does this work? Well, he faces the following sort of problem. There are some moral rules that we have in our society and most others that seem to not only not match our natural tendencies, but seem to be in direct competition or contrast with them. Namely this, things like justice, obligations to keep promises, obedience to the state, and of course, chastity, basically abstinence. And those seem to go against our natural impulses. And so, a good question would be is, if we're just driven by you know, the passions, why then do we have all this stuff that seems to go contrary to our passions? And again, his answer is basically these two. So how, does the, how do those play out? Well, social utility works in the following way. He claims that we're motivated to go against our, some of our natural passions <laughs> by social utility. And he calls these the artificial virtues. Now, Following the model, you know, put forth by other thinkers, you know, like basically like you know Hobbes, etc. He says our natural impulses, unregulated, could cause us to act kind of bad. To any one of the things again he's known for is a character called the sensible knave, someone who basically breaks the rules when it's to advantage to do so. And it seems like a sensible thing to do. You know, why follow the rules if you can get a, get away with them? It's a classical problem for for ethics. Now, Hume's argument basically is this. Why should we follow the social rules that seem to go against our natural impulses? I mean, we take the obvious example of politics. We might say that humans have a natural impulse to, we might say to be you know, sexist, that males have a natural impulse not to be faithful. And so why would we go along with you know, monogamy? Why would we have that, that word true? We were just, you know, unfaithful creatures. Well, Hume's argument is social utility. We, even though our passions push us one way, we sort out that in the long run, it's in our best interest not to give in to those particular impulses. So he claims, out of self-interest, we follow the rules of social utility, even though they go against our passions, which would seem to be, you know, we do so out of reason. You know, that we reason, even though I really, really want to do this, reason tells me it'll be bad for me, so I don't do this. Now, human, of course, can work in the passions. So you could say, well, my passion is pushing me to do one thing, but then I also have a passion to, like, say, suppose I have, like, to take an example of a politician. They want to, like, have an affair, and their passion is pushing them away, but then they think, Oh, but if I do that and I get caught, I won't be able to be present. And so they would use one passion to kind of control another by appealing to their own self-interest, perhaps. Now, what about the sympathy thing? Well, this is what he claims. Now, again, at the start, you might think, well, Hume's making morality kind of, you know, awful. He says it's a slave of passion, you know, reason is a slave of passions. He reasoned, you know, 
can't give you a reason to refer, you know, the structure of the world, you know, the scratch of your finger over the structure of the world, et cetera, et cetera. But he thinks that we have, you know, a certain saving grace, namely this. He thinks that we have a passion for justice, that injustice, even with far away from us, so far away that it doesn't even affect our own interests, our own advantages, we still find it displeasing. Which is kind of an interesting question. You know, for example, if you listen to the radio, you listen to the news, and you hear about, say, what Boko Haram is doing in Nigeria, you know, in fact, today is the uh, one year anniversary when the, yeah, the kidnappings. It's one year ago today. Yeah, it's a year. And even though, for most of us, it doesn't affect us individually. Oh, and so the area is that life yesterday, too. That affected me greatly. I felt good about that. Yeah, so even even if it's not you know directly you know involved in our life, we still feel bad about injustices and good all regards is justice. So Hume thinks that we have a, a passion, a natural sympathy, so injustice displeases us, even when it's far away, even when we don't have anything in the game. Or so he claims. Now he does also know basically the way it works is this. We have more sympathy towards those closer to us, but we're able to generalize, you know, at a broad distance. So his claim is, is we do have sympathy. So that, in a way, that's kind of our saving grace. So even though we're driven by, you know, our passions, etc., one of our driving things is also sympathy. Or so he claims. Now, one sort of uh, fairly stock dispute in philosophy is. The classic question, you know, why do people do what they do? And some people take the view that people do act out of benevolence, that we do act from altruism, we care about others. Other people make the claim that even what seems to be benevolence or sympathy or care for others is really just selfishness. That we, for example, will, will do things for other people that may seem benevolent, but it's really secretly selfish. I mean, people often, you know, the classic line is, People only do things that they want to do. And so it's regarded as selfishness. Now, and so one of the challenges has been, how do you show that there is benevolence? There's a, a classic Abraham Lincoln story. There's also a program, because this is also the 150th anniversary when Lincoln got shot. He was shot today, well, 150 years ago today, shot in Ford's theater and died the next day. But there's a story about Lincoln where he was in a stagecoach riding along, and the stagecoach stops. Um, and there's a about the pig, you know, whose little piglets are like, you know, off, like, you know, separated, kind of stuck in the mud. And so Abe gets out of the out of the stagecoach, goes down, and rescues the piglets. And he'd been, you know, coincidentally enough, he'd been arguing with someone else, another passenger in the stagecoach, arguing that people only do things from selfishness. And so the person said, you just proved yourself wrong, you know, Abe. You went down there and rescued those pigs. You had nothing to gain. He said, quite the contrary, sir. The, their crying was disturbing me, so I had to go down there and rescue them. And so, of course, you know, the kind of point being made there is that one analysis of seeming benevolence is that it's always in our self-interest. We're always acting selfishly, even when we seem to act for others. And again, people have been debating a long time What's the real explanation? Is there really thing? Is there really any benevolence, or are we just selfish and occasionally do things for others, but it's really secretly selfishness? The second option. <laughs> yeah, it could be the second option. Now, Hume's view, interesting enough or boring enough, is this: he says that benevolence is not just self-love. You know, Lincoln, of course, is telling a humorous story. But he thinks, you know, that when we're doing stuff for others, it's not just done for ourselves, not just done for selfishness. And he claims that we, as Bill Clinton would say, did say, we feel other people's pain. That it's not just selfishness on our part, we actually do care. Now, how does he argue for this? How do you argue against psychological egoism? The view that all we do is what we think is in our own self-interest. Well, 
he uses standard appeal. He basically says, just kind of look around at how people act. And he says, to the most careless observer, it is obvious that there is benevolence. There is generosity. There is love, friendship, compassion, and gratitude. That there is sympathy. And Hume basically says, you know, it's just obvious. It's something that can't be denied. Now, of course, people have endeavored to deny it, but it is kind of a fundamental question in ethics and about human nature. Do we have sympathy, gratitude, generosity, love, and affection, or is that just a cover for selfishness? And it's kind of a core question in psychology, also in ethics. The correct answer? No. We don't know. And our inclinations tend to be our views of the world, whether you believe in love or just self-love. Okay, before getting the final part of Hume, namely his view of religion, anything about ethical theory or personal identity that needs more human stuff. Now, Hume, I mentioned, was quite interested in philosophy of religion and you know, did a, a book on this. Now, Hume in his own time was accused of being an atheist. But as I mentioned before, back in these days, being an atheist was kind of a flexible term. It wasn't necessarily that you didn't believe in God, it's that you didn't believe like in the right kind of God in the right kind of way. So, for example, strictly speaking, the deists wouldn't be atheists because they believed in God. But they might be sort of looked at as being kind of like atheists. Now, he was not an atheist. Well, he was dead now, so he's probably nothing. But in his own day, he wasn't an atheist. Why not? Well, only you can see it as being kind of a technicality. And here's why. If you're an atheist, real for real, you believe there is no God. You're confident about that. If you're a theist, you believe there is a God. And you're confident about that. The other option, of course, is to be kind of agnostic, to be uncertain. So someone who's skeptical about God isn't an atheist, because they don't disbelieve God with certainty. They just don't know. They're neither a theist nor an atheist. Now, Hume takes a skeptical approach to religion. And in his dialogues concerning natural religion, he basically lays out his arguments. And it involves, in the dialogues, he's got two characters doing their talky stuff. Oh, actually, we're at the start of three. There's Cleanthes, who is a the theist who believes in God, and he presents a posteriori arguments for God. And these are basically arguments, you know, based in experiments. The second character is Demia, who is also a believer in God, but he relies on faith and a priori, arguments based in pure reason. Philo, essentially who speaks for Hume, is a skeptic. Now you can always tell in a dialogue who represents the views of the author. It's going to be the character who wins, unless the writer is doing something pretty unusual. So Philo wins, so we know the other characters are not Hume's view. Now, Hume argues not that God doesn't exist. What he argues is all of the arguments for God that there could be can't succeed. But on the flip side, all the arguments against God are not decisive. So he's neither, at least on that analysis, neither a theist nor an atheist, but a skeptic. Or as people may prefer to say, agnostic. So how does this work? Well, again, for, for Hume, there's really only you know, two sorts of ways of, know of knowledge. The relations of ideas, you know, pure reason, and matters of fact. So how does reason work? Well, we know Hume's view is this. Being an empiricist, he thinks that by pure reason, you can know relations of ideas. You can know triangles have three sides, you can know bachelors are married, 
you can know if A is larger than B, and B is larger than C, that A is larger than C. But being an empiricist, he contends you can't know about the existence of stuff. So you can know a triangle has three sides, but you can't know if there's a triangle in Alaska or not. And so because of this, he believes that all the a priori arguments for God's existence cannot succeed. Because by its very nature, reason cannot prove the existence of stuff. Now, some of the other dead guys we looked at before, a good dead friend, you know, Leibniz, a good dead friend Descartes, would of course take issue with that. So one of the sort of core debates throughout you know, modern philosophy and to today is can reason tell, tell us whether stuff exists or not? Or does it have to be you know, by pure empirical means? And the debate still goes on to this day. Again, to use like a contemporary example, scientists claim there's dark matter and dark energy. You could say in part that it involves this. You know, our information requires we posit something we have no empirical, direct empirical evidence for. Or an even better example would be you know, alternative universes. We can never observe those empirically, presumably, but, you know, according to our theories, yeah, they exist. That would be like pure reason. So reason is out for you. So all arguments for God that are a priori, toss them. But again, keep in mind, people like Descartes would disagree with that. Now, the second type of reasoning he allows is basically, you know, reason on matters of fact. And he claims that when we're reasoning about matters of fact here, we're basically using causal reason. And he considers arguments, well, here's a typical argument. They're basically, you know, cosmo what are called cosmological arguments. The idea that, you know, crudely put, you gotta have a cause for everything. And this cause has got to be God, so God's got to exist. You know, very, very crudely put. So why does he reject that? Well, given his analysis of causation, here's how it have to work. The way people often use like the, the causal argument is they to use a crap analogy. If you get a house, or let's use the analogy of a watch. That's like the classic one. You know, suppose you find a, a watch on an island. Well, you would think that something intelligent built the watch. You wouldn't think it just you know, appeared. And people might argue, well, you know, we got a universe, you know, or you use the analogy of the house. You got a house, if you saw a house, you wouldn't think the house just appeared, you'd think something intelligent created it. So by analogy, you look at the universe, you say, oh, something must have built it, an intelligent cause must have created it. Now here's how Hume goes after that. When it comes to houses, we believe houses are built by intelligent beings because we've seen that happen. We have, you know, given Hume's analysis of cause and effect, we have that, you know, habituation. We see, like, you know, empty lot, people show up, we see people building it, we see a house. So when we see a house, we infer that it was built by people. Now, crudely put, did we see the universe being built? No. So Hume says we can't use that cause and effect argument because we never observed the universe being built, so we don't know how they come about, or so he claims. Now again, people, not everyone buys his criticism of the argument, but given his view of causation, it works. Final thing for today, what about the design problem? Well, one thing, going back to our watch example, one kind of class example you know, is the watch argument. Suppose you're on a desert island, and you find a watch. Would you think that A, oh wow, what an amazing thing. All the, the tide and the wind blowing together sand and you know, shells built this watch. Or would you think, given the complexity of the design, somebody intelligent must have built it? Somebody yeah, because you'd say the odds of like, you know, seagull feathers and sand and rocks and, you know, crab shells and stuff. Unless it was made out of well, yeah if, you saw, yeah, if you saw them all jammed together, you might say, hey. but if you found like a, you, or you found a watch made of all that stuff, you'd still probably think, yeah, the odds of that all kind of like blowing together and making a fully functional timepiece, really, really astronomical. 
So we apply the same thing to the universe. We look at the universe, everything seems very designed, like our hand, our eyes, etc. you know, the earth, you know, the solar system. And so we infer, you know, there's a design, no design without a designer, God. Now interestingly, boringly enough, Hume presents what can be seen as an, you know, an early evolution argument. And of course, you know, even though Darwin gets, you know, credited with the theory of evolution, the idea of evolution predates Darwin by thousands of years. And what Hume basically argues is this. Why do things appear designed for where they are? Why, for example, the fish seem so well designed? Well, his argument is very straightforward. If something didn't fit its environment, well, it'd be dead. So fish appear to be designed for water because if they couldn't survive in water, they'd be dead. You wouldn't see them. Why do we seem to fit our environment? Well, if we didn't fit it, we'd be dead. So you can explain it by not by design, but by what we now call natural selection. And so I see natural selection is selected as for out of time. And so next we meet, we'll finish up Hume, and we'll go on to our last uh, dead guy in the modern era, our good dead friend, Emmanuel Kant.